Happy Sabbath. Good morning. I hope your week has been well from wherever you're joining us from. Karibu sana to another study that we said we are going to do. We are in lesson seven. It's been uh, a whole journey. We just started the other day and here we are. God has really kept us. He's been faithful. He's given us the strength and the grace to be studying this lesson. And now we are on lesson seven. Blessed are those who believe. Blessed are those who believe. I pray by the end of this lesson, you'll jump ship to this side of being blessed. And because you have decided, you've made a decision to actually believe in Christ. Uh, I'm joined by a wonderful team who will help us through this study, who will help us to decipher what is, who are these that are blessed and what does it mean to be blessed and what does, how does, do we come to a point where we have, we believe. We are going to also look at different uh, characters in the Bible through the book of John. John is still our author and we are still exploring the themes that he has wrote in his book, John. Uh, before we get into into that. I'll ask that uh, Nsongo to pray for us uh, so that we can start. Uh, let's believe and pray. Our kind of loving Father and Master, we thank you and praise you for an opportunity once again to delve into scripture. We ask, dear Lord, as you inspired John, may you equally inspire and lead our minds and our discussions this particular day, that indeed we may see Christ high and lifted up, and may we be partakers of those who are blessed because we believe. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, starting on my right, uh, please tell us your name and what you'll be taking us through. Happy Sabbath. Um, I pray God has been with you this week. My name is Chris Paul Mbegera. I'm going to take us through hacking back to Abraham and the witness of Thomas. Mm. Amen. 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 Uh, good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Marion and I'll be taking us through the witness of Mary. Okay. My name is Nsongo uh, Raphael. I'll be looking at the unwitting witness of Pilate. Okay. As you heard, we are going to explore very different characters. Thomas, Mary, Pilate, you know, and even the crowd once again. Um, our memory text comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they have believed. Somewhere else in the Bible we are told, uh, seeing like how faith is, like you are, you already, you, you've already seen these things in faith. You've not beheld them in your hands, but you've already believed in them. And that is what is defined as faith. And John has presented to us people from diverse backgrounds. He has presented to us Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a teacher of the law. Uh, so to speak, he belonged to the uh, high hierarchy of the people of the Jewish community at his time. He has presented to us uh, the woman at the well from Samaria, from Samaria or the Samaritan woman. And these are the people like we talked about and said they were not a uh, pure Jewish people and they were looked upon by the Jewish community with a lot of disdain. He has presented to us Nathaniel. He has presented to us even John the Baptist. Various people from various diverse backgrounds learned and, and not learned all to us. And what has been their testimony? Some have said, behold the Lamb of God. Some have said, we have found the Messiah. Others say that we have found him of whom Moses wrote. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, as others have witnessed. Could this be the Christ? Others have asked. We ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is is indeed Christ the Savior of the world. Others have affirmed, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal, other, of eternal life. Others have confidently asked and confidently even answered themselves, I believe that you are Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Though I was blind, now I see. You remember the blind man that was healed and even excommunicated from from church just because he dared to say that he is the Messiah. 
I find no fault in him, as we will find out later through the witness of Pilate, my Lord and my God. Who are some of these people? Can you remember them? Can you place them just from the context of their speech? And why did they testify as they did to identify Jesus? This week, we are going to look at these people that believed. We are going to look the certainty, the confidence of those that dared to believe and why they are being called blessed. Um, <clears throat> our first lesson, hacking back to Abraham, is where we start from. Hacking back to Abraham, uh, who else can be told blessed are those who believe than uh, Abraham? Uh, who He who is popularly referred to as the very father of faith. Um, in the life of Abraham, in Genesis, we his call and the response, uh, he, he, how he responds to the call of God for him. Uh, in Genesis 18, actually, uh, 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 Abraham is, uh, God says that, I know that Abraham will, will, will commune and will, will bring his household according to the path of I need to reveal to him the plan that I have for him and we see that uh, God had um, a special reason why he calls Abraham and Abraham the reason why Abraham is placed in the at the very outset of the lesson I believe by the writers is to give us a picture of who God, he himself was in the experience of giving his son Jesus to come die for us. In giving, uh, Abraham is called to uh, offer sac the sacrifice of his son Isaac, the, his only son. And it was, it, had, it was a son who God had told him in Isaac, the uh, thy seed shall be called. And through him, through Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be, will be blessed. So, and through that son, now Christ, uh, sorry, uh, God once calls upon Abraham and he wants him to offer him as a sacrifice. And we know the story how it goes, how uh, as Isaac bears this, the the. He goes up the hill with together with the father, and what happened eventually that a ram was provided as a as a as a substitute for Isaac. So we see some parallels, interesting parallels. How Abraham points to us the character of the father. How Abraham is the is the antitypical is is not antitypical. He is a type of God the Father. The same way God the Father had to offer Christ for our salvation, so we see Abraham's willingness to offer Isaac when he is called upon to offer the sacrifice. We see the heart of the Father in Abraham. In Isaac, we see Jesus, how Christ was willing to go to the cross so that we might be saved. The only contrast between Isaac and Abraham, uh, sorry, Isaac and uh, and Jesus, is that for Isaac, we have a substitute, because of course he was he was by him dying he could not have uh, brought any salvation. But in Christ, Christ there was no substitute. He went through with the plan of salvation and he died on the cross. Mm. And thus we see that in the faith of Abraham, in the faith of Abraham, we see that when we believe, we have a powerful, this um, recurring theme we have had, we give a powerful witness of even the heart of the Father. I'm very sure that Abraham in heaven, thousands of years later on, when he will be in heaven and see the effect of the, of the response he had to go with Isaac to uh, to the mountain to have that sacrifice made he will he would not have imagined that he was bearing witness of the heart of the father that thousands thousands of years down the line Christ the ultimate lamb of God could be born of the same and 
and and this this is quite important because sometimes uh uh in in uh, abraham crosses over abraham is one of the typical is one of the is in the jewish culture he was he was he, one whom they considered their father in fact in john chapter 8 where the lesson draws its context there is that argument about we have abraham for our father we are not born of fornication that's what the jews were talking about but christ says if you if abraham is your father then you would do the works that abraham did and that is interesting you know sometimes we want to relate with these patriarchs and prophets but we don't relate to them to the extent to which they re, they they exemplified the faith that god wants us to have in him and that is quite crucial for us as we as 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 as, as christians that the faith of abraham the very faith of abraham in hebrews 11 those who respond in faith hebrews 11 um we are told that those who respond with a similar faith as the faith of abraham are the children they are the one who bear the identity as the children of abraham mm. amen amen you know jesus continues to say in john chapter 8 uh in the same chapter chapter 8 your father abraham rejoiced to see my day verse 56 you know uh i i look at abraham and the sacrifice of laying his time at the altar you know as a sacrificial lamb and the things that he had to go through you have been promised this son and then you are being told you know what you have to sacrifice this son and he understands the pain he understands that it needs a lot of like giving yourself completely to get to a place where you are willing to actually sacrifice your son. And when Jesus is actually saying this was your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, he would have been happy to see it because he would have known that, you know what, the final lamb, like as Chris Paul has told us, Isaac was just a substitute. He was just like, this is what is going to happen in the future. But now Abraham would have been very happy to witness it that this is actually it came to pass you know how does it feel to actually live in the prayers that you have made how does it feel to actually find out that you know what this is an answered prayer adam Abraham, abraham would have really rejoiced but here we've been meeting people who have been in conflict in division here and there trying to even debate amongst themselves who is this christ who is he is he the one and that brings us to the book of romans chapter 4 verse 1 to 5 which i will read um what then shall we say that abraham our father was found according to the flesh for abraham was justified by works he for by works he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are counted as grace, but as a debt. Um, the question that maybe I'll ask, Paul is here using the story of Abraham to reveal to us that salvation is not just salvation alone and we have to do it has to be accompanied by works even though the works don't really self, do not really save us so how does this how do these verses help us to understand the idea of abraham as the father of those that believe by faith on songa uh, it's an powerful uh, illustration of, uh, of, of what faith is, the life of Abraham. If you may perhaps borrow with me from the book of Hebrews 11, let's just like to, uh, from verse 8, um, after in verse 1, he has described faith. Paul says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, as Ramona had earlier on alluded. And in verse 8, he says, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went that his faith was that when he hears when god calls once god has spoken he obeys even if he doesn't really understand everything he doesn't know the whole story he did he continues and says he dwelt in the land of promise 
as in a strange country by faith, you know. Uh, and, and, and eventually he says, through faith, Sarah also received, you know, a child because she judged him faithful who had promised. Even if she had doubted at some point, she eventually had faith when the angel, um, when God became serious and told her, at this time, uh, next year, you shall be able to have a child. And ultimately, uh, in verse 17, it says that once again, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he, and he had received the promises offered up to, up, up, offered up his only, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom he said, uh, this is Isaac, after whom your seed shall be called. Verse 19 tells us what, 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 what exactly it was. It was accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he had also received him in figure. So you see, Abraham is called the father of faith, not because he had anything to depend upon or that he was able to do, but because even in give, getting a child, even in getting a place to settle, he believed in God, what God had said. He still, he, he, he believed. He said, uh, God had said, move from this place to a place where I will show you, you know, and uh, he moves from security, he breaks up from from, from, from friends, from family, and, and he goes to a place where he doesn't know the future, but he still goes. And that is why Abraham is called um, a father of faith. And therefore, faith truly, uh, the, great, the, the great thing of salvation is it is by faith. We do not know uh, how it will go, but we obey because we trust in God. And that is where faith comes into play. And Abraham is a wonderful example of one who believed and, and, and is an example of faith. Mm -hmm. We do not know how things will turn out, but because we have this faith, let us do it. And someone else who made that decision that I do not know how things will turn out, but this is the faith I have. I believe in Christ is Mary. And we're going to look at the witness of Mary. Look about the witness of Mary. And this is the account from John chapter 12 like from verse 1 to verse 8. Um, we know of Mary because she was the sister to Martha and also the sister to Lazarus, who was their brother. And we've seen of Lazarus and heard of him, that he was the one who had been raised to life. And now we are brought to a scene where we can actually see Christ communing with him and the rest of the family. Um, of this family and these siblings, uh, I believe Ellen White in writing, she uh, accounts that uh, Christ had loved to take a repose upon the home um, in Bethany and he had found a sweet friendship with his family. And here we see that uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus comes to visit them and we see that he is... Um, given a meal, he he's and verse two says they, there they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him, as we had said, and we can see that Mary uh, b uh, goes down to the master. And this is verse 3 when it says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, uh, uh, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of ointment. Now it is told that the perfume was actually very expensive. About a, a year's, uh, uh, the worth about a year's wages for the common laborer. You can imagine um, how much that must have costed her. Um, and Mary had probably bought this gift as an expression of gratitude to the Savior and even uh, gratitude for, uh, as a gratitude to the Savior because of the forgiveness of her sins and equally because her brother had been raised from the dead. The story continues to bring into picture also one of the disciples as we know him, and this is Judas Iscariot, and he um, seeing this act he is moved upon himself to to comment and he says um that is verse five and he says why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor mm. verse six it says this he said not that he cared for the poor and we can now see uh john he's giving more context and he says 
this he said not that he cared for the poor but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there in so essentially Judas was in the treasury department and he was notorious for a lot of mischief in that department and verse 7 it says Jesus now responding he says then Jesus said let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Um, a recurring theme throughout the gospel is that Jesus knows what is in people. And we can clearly see this in the stark contrast in, I can say the character of, of these two people. This is, that is Mary, and we can see of Judas as well. In Judas, we can see that his greed um, overwhelmed him. And in, in Mary, we can see a heart that was contrite, if we can say. John, uh, in giving, he gives a, uh, that Judas was a self-serving thief. And Ellen White, in writing uh, in Desire of Ages, page 560, writing of this encounter, she says, the fragrant gift which Mary had bought to lavish upon the dead body of the Savior she poured upon his living form. At the burial, its sweetness could only have pervaded the tomb. Now it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed and earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones forever. You know, of us, um, of scripture it is told the love that Christ has for us and the love that he has for the church but this gives a very beautiful twist in that we can now see that the, the individual that has been dearly loved has as, as it is said in, in uh, spirit of prophecy that love awakens love and here we can see a heart that is one with gratitude and even with love for his master. And we can see uh, what acts they, they seek out to achieve. And so it is for us that we should not be ashamed to express our love for the master. You know, we can witness for him, but we should also uh, express our love to our master. That can be in whatever means that you are impressed upon to, to do. For some, it might be in cheerful giving. To others, it is offering their lives as a sweet fragrance as it is. They're, they lay down their lives to be offered and to serve the master and to, and to accomplish his purposes in this life. And so whatever it might be to you, whatever it will be revealed to you to express your love to the master, may you uh, not hesitate in, in, in doing it. Amen. Amen. Powerful. Whatever that we're supposed to do to reveal our love for Christ, we are not to be hesitant on doing it. Let us doing it. Let us do it because Christ will appreciate it as we have seen that Christ came even into the rescue of Mary when Judas was having this thought that, you know what, this, why is she wasting this uh, perfume? And John is really careful to tell us that, you know, it's not like he cared. He was self-seeking himself he had other interests that are not so nice and now that tells us that Christ actually sees our hearts when we are doing these things when we are wiping seats uh, in church Christ is actually seeing us and he knows our hearts and what should this tell us um uh, about the need of Christ as our righteousness, transforming us and covering us as well, given that we know that Christ actually knows our hearts. The life of Mary and the fact that Christ knew who Mary was. Uh, remember also in John chapter 8, after the multitude has gone away, they, when they had brought her to the feet of Christ and they were about to stone her. Mm. And then Christ tells uh, sends them away after after they have gone away Christ remains with her and at that point of uh, the two of them alone Christ tells her a personal thing that is very powerful and I believe she carried the memory of it and it might have brought it really brought the transformation he says he told her woman um, uh, thy sins are forgiven go and they and sin no more um 
how why is it that Christ could tell her that it's because he had the confidence mm. that if Mary would believe mm. in the word of the Messiah who was mm. telling her that she would actually wake up from that position of shame that mm. she had been brought and she could go and not sin anymore mm. so she was Mary rising from that position of vulnerability she was going forth in the power of the word of the Christ Amen. and we too can go forth in the word of Christ mm. Christ knows us he knows that we are made of very weak material mm. and when he tells us a word that we can bring out his righteousness in our lives we can take hold upon that word and like Mary we can bear a witness that Christ has done for us that which we could not do for ourselves amen Amen. You know, sometimes we want to serve Christ, but we remember of our sins. We remember of what people have labeled upon us because of the things we have done. You want to come and even chorister here at the pulpit, but you remember so and so knows my sin and they will label it upon me. Christ is telling you, I know your heart. I know your heart is in what you want to do for me. It could be even welcoming a visitor in church. It is really a small act, but Christ sees through your heart and he knows the genuineness of what you are about to do. We cannot see your heart and that is why we are quick to remember the things we, you have done. That is why we are quick to say that... you. This should have been done. This could have been done. You know, why are you still giving money to this corrupt church? Why are you still doing this and that? Yet clearly the evidence upon our eyes is that things are evil and thoroughly evil. Christ sees our hearts. And if anything is not, if you have been discouraged, this should be your encouragement that Christ sees your heart and he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask of him according to the power that he has given us to exalt us. You know, we might be uh, really condensed, condescended in the eyes of men, but Christ is able to lift us up because he sees our hearts and he accepts our offerings. So do not hesitate to do the right thing just because of the things that have happened to you in the past. And now we move to one interesting character, Pilate. Pilate was faced with a very tough balance to please the masses or actually witness the truth. And Songo is going to take us through that. All right. So the witness of uh, Pilate, the unwitting, uh, in fact, uh, the lesson author titles it the unwitting witness of Pilate. And in essence, uh, Pilate was not, um, was, was, did not speak in parables, but it was very, very clear. You know, there was no wit to it. It was very plain. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, the story is captured from the book of John chapter 18, from verse 28 onwards to chapter 19, up to verse 7. And the Bible records that many an instance Christ had told his disciples that his time had not yet come. Mm. But lo and behold, the time had come and in which Christ had been captured on Thursday evening. And on Friday morning, they, were, were, they had brought him before Pilate's judgment hall. And in verse 29... Pilate asks, what accusation bring ye against this man? And eventually they say, the Jews say, we are not mad, you know. By the time we have brought him here, he's just know he's a troublemaker. Mm. You know, he's not a good man. And, and, and therefore, uh, Pilate said, okay, then judge him according to your law. And then they said that it is not lawful for us to do what? To put any man to death because the Romans were in power. Mm. And all, all, all citizens were in essence under Roman, Roman law and rule and therefore you couldn't take life without their p permission and therefore now Pilate ask, asked then what exactly then is this matter then uh, that requires this man to to die and in verse 33 he asks uh, he calls he calls Jesus and said to him asks him art thou the king of the Jews and Christ answers and say says thou this thy thing of thyself or did others tell it tell it thee of of me then Pilate answers and says, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus said, answers and says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered into the, in, to the Jews. 
but now is my kingdom not from hence. And now this thing, now Pilate realizes that this is an interesting person that I'm speaking to, you know. And he says, art thou a king then? Because he's speaking about a kingdom and he says, my kingdom. And he says, are you a king? Then Jesus says, thou says that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, and that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And ultimately now, Pilate asks this wonderful question uh, that has echoed throughout uh, the ages. What is truth? And after he had said this, he goes out and he says, he declares in verse 38, I find no fault at all in this man. Having declared himself king, having said that his kingdom is not of this world, having said all these things that had arced the Jews and, and the Pharisees and had made them ang angry, Pilate said, the things this man says, there is no fault in him. This looks like a sincere man. He may be deluded, he may be crazy, but he's not one worthy of, 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 of the accusations that you've put against him, and I find no fault in him. And therefore, uh, once again, the disciples, uh, he now says that there's a custom to release one prisoner. And uh, he was hoping that he could release for them this man who, who um, he found no fault in. But now the Jews um, cried for Barabbas. And eventually, again, in chapter 19 and verse 4, the Bible records um, cry, Pilate decided perhaps just flog this man, beat him a bit, uh, satisfy the anger of these people, humiliate him before him, before them, and maybe they will, they will be placated and, and persuaded to, to, to let him go. And so he does this. And the Bible records uh, in verse 2, the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on, on him a purple robe, almost befitting purple, the color of royalty, and a crown of thorns. And uh, mocking him, he said, Hail the king of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. And then Pilate now brings him forth again and says, Behold, I bring forth to you, I bring him forth to you, that he may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate once again bears this testimony and says, This man is faultless. He comes again uh, and he brings forth Christ in this purple robe and this crown of thorns, and he says, Behold the man. And once again, the Jews say, crucify him, crucify him. You know, baying and crying for blood. Now eventually, Pilate gives in to these uh, people and says, take him and crucify him. For I find what? No fault in him. And they say that uh, eventually, they sort of um, twist Pilate and say, if you release this man, therefore you cannot be Caesar's friend. Because this man claimed to be what? Claimed to be king. And, and, and eventually, because of peer pressure, we see Pilate gives in to these men, um, uh, to, the, to the Jewish leaders and, and, and the scribes and the Pharisees. And eventually, he says, okay, you guys take him and crucify him. But before he does that, he prepares a plaque and it is put... Um, in writing in the book of uh, John chapter 19 and verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And, it, and this writing was once again the unwitting testimony of Pilate, as the writer says, and it was this plaque which says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Whether it was put there to mock him, whether it was to pay homage to this madman whom they thought to be mad, or to this man whom the Jews had demanded to die, nonetheless, something in Pilate moved him to... Uh, to order for this plaque to be made. And it, it spoke to any and every person who, who passed by there. And it said that this man, was, this man was Jesus of Nazareth. And he was the king of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. It's an interesting, um, an interesting um, question that Pilate asked, what is truth? And Christ had declared to him that his kingdom is a kingdom of truth. And indeed Christ it was the way, the truth, and the life. Christ was the truth that was before him. And Pilate, in interrogating the truth, in interrogating Christ, he couldn't find any fault in it. And I believe even we equally, if we were to meet with Christ, we will not find any fault in him because he is, he is truthful and, uh, and he is the truth. And unfortunately, that which the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees couldn't see, 
Pilate could see clearly that this was an innocent man. And he was a witness that he said this man, in fact, everything he says is plausible and could be true. And it is not worthy to put him, uh, to put him down, to, to, to crucify him. And uh, he said it three times. I find no fault in this man. And eventually, because of peer pressure, um, and, uh, and the men had evoked the, the interest of Caesar and said, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Because this man uh, is causing um, a ruckus. This man is causing difficulty. In verse 12, he says, And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not what? Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, speaketh against Caesar. So they, it seems as if they were going to accuse him uh, to his superiors as one who had allowed uh, somebody else who had claimed um, kingship. But Pilate understood that Christ had said his kingdom was not the kingdom of this world. It was not the kingdom of this world. And he did not find any fault in him. But because in order to save face with these men and women whom he, was, he, he had rulership over, uh, whose mandate he had been given over by, by Caesar, Pilate reluctantly releases, uh, releases Christ to be crucified. But before then, he's sort of almost wanting to mock the Jews also. He says, put this title at the cross, Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. And the Bible records it was written in many languages. It was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Such that whosoever passes by there would see for a fact something has happened here. I will question the story of this man. Why is it interesting that all these other thieves don't have any uh, insignia on their crosses, but the man on the middle cross of him, he is called a king of the Jews. And perhaps a conversation would start about who Christ was and what he had done. And that was Pilate's witness of Christ. Uh, it's a very interesting witness, uh, one that is full of many stories. But because time is far much spent, we won't dwell on it, but just ask ourselves this question that I, we already answered in a way when we, during the last lesson we were talking about how to just uh, have a backbone uh, against peer pressure, and now we are focusing on this one person, Pilate. He's giving us an example of what it can happen to you. So, how can we keep? How can we keep from doing what? How, how can we not repeat his mistake? You know, this is the right thing, but you do the wrong thing. How can we not? How can we keep ourselves from doing the wrong thing? Um, the evidence of peer pressure is clearly seen in the story of Pilate and in Hind's story we also um, see that the wife had received visions mm -hmm. and dreams and it was told of her as she, now he speaks to Pilate that have nothing to do with this man mm -hmm. so I think for Pilate he had compelling evidence for him on the choice that he ought mm -hmm. to have taken mm -hmm. and I think this is a clear sign of where it is expedient often times to listen to your wife and in the experience or at least in the experience of Pilate but we can see the direction that Pilate takes and for him what was considered merely as temporal benefits had in its real sense eternal consequences by this we know that he had condemned the master to to death and uh, this had uh, eternal consequences f for him in that um, uh, he had been lost, we can say that. And for us, the lesson truly is that um, sometimes we're put in positions where we can either stand for the master or we can, turn, we can refuse him, you know. Uh, we can confess him among men and we can deny him. And I pray that ours will be the experience to confess him. Uh, not desirous of temporal benefits, but looking forward into the eternal consequences that will come. And so uh, is for us to learn the same. Yeah. Sadly, it ends so badly for Pilate because he ends up committing suicide. Uh, just because... He it was such a deep, like you had the moment to just do the right thing. And it hurt him to the core and he died a lost man. And it happens so to Judas too. And I pray that will not be our story. What is the witness of Thomas? 
Thomas um, comes to the scene at the very tail end of Christ's ministry, it seems he's one of those disciples, among the disciples of Christ, whom we do not hear much about, but up to the end of, uh, of, of, of Christ's ministry. And in Christ's resurrection in John chapter 20, uh, from verse 19, Christ has resurrected and he appears to the disciples. And the setting is that it seems Thomas was not among them as he as Christ appears to them. And Christ shows them the evidence that I have resurrected. I am here in verse 20 says that peace. Then Jesus said to them, uh, again, peace be unto you. Even as my father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Ghost. So uh, Thomas, when he comes back, the disciples share with him the experience they have had with Christ. Tells them uh, that, you know, our master who died a few year, days ago has actually appeared to us. Thomas had been, we are, we are told that all the disciples had forsaken Jesus and fled. So Thomas was among them as they fled away. Now coming back to be only to be told that, hey, you guys, when you are not here, things have happened. The master has actually resurrected and he has appeared to us. It was very difficult for him to believe. And now Christ has to come in a second time. And Thomas' words are very emphatic. He says that unless I see the Savior, unless I put my hands into the print of the nails, that's verse 26, and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. He is very clear that I will not believe unless I see and touch. You know, you know sometimes uh, there's this popular English uh, saying, that, saying that seeing is believing. That I have to see before I believe. Most of it is in things to do with financial transactions. Unless I see the money in my account, I'm not going to go on with this uh, engagement. But God, uh, Christ in now verse 26, when he appears again, he, of course, it seems like Christ uh, submits to the request of Thomas and he, he allows him to touch his hands and to put uh, his, uh, his hand on his side. And then verse 29 is, very, uh, is, is the key text of our week. This lesson says that Jesus said to him, because, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen, but yet they have believed. It seems like Christ raises, raises the idea of faith beyond evidences of things which we have seen. In Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In a sense, also faith can be described as we seeing things that God sees but we cannot see by our physical eyes. There are things that God can see that are not appreciated with the, in the physical realm of things. And that is the, 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 the vision that, that the, uh, so to say, the vision of faith. It is, it is not just foresight, but it is you see something that can become a reality that is not physical but a potential in the realm of things. So that is what Christ says. And there were many people, it's not only Thomas who struggled with seeing so that he could believe. We are told, the lesson writer points out that Thomas was dictating the condition of his faith. And this approach to faith in Christ appears again and again. Nicodemus is, himself says, I cannot, I don't think that a man can be born again. How can he go back into the woman's, his mother's womb? The crowd that had been fed with the loaves and Fisher says, what sign? We want to see a sign so that we can believe you. And to us, we are challenged with this lesson this week that our faith in Christ must be founded on things not seen. The evidence of what we looked at last week, the word, when the word tells us this is what God has revealed to us, his son, we are to build our faith. And yes, we must believe 
in Christ. Amen. Amen. And just to close it up uh, on the witness of Thomas, Ellen White in Steps to Christ, page 105, says, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason and this testimony is abundant. So God does not ask us to do things that are not within our reach. He's actually, he knows we are able and that is why he's asking us to do. He's given us sufficient evidence. If you do not want to, someone jokes and say, if you do not believe in God, then tell us who put the water in the <laughs> in the pineapple, you know, or who put the sugar in, in that juice of the pineapple, or who put the sugar in a sugar cane. Tell us who did that, you know, <laughs> if you are not. Like Christ has given us enough and sufficient evidence upon which we can base our faith, our witness of Jesus. When we were doing lesson five, we were t- talking about witnesses. We've been talking about witnesses, different of them, many of them, but here is based on our own witness. So I'll ask you, brethren, what is your witness of Christ? My witness will be simple. Christ has answered my prayers with terrible exactness. If I were to tell you all the stories that Christ, or all the stories of the answered prayers that Christ has given me, you'd be in awe because it owes me that. You know what, Christ? I asked you of this and you answered me with terrible, terrible exactness as how I asked of you. So my question to you is, do you have a testimony? The signs that Christ has given us, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, Christ giving sight to the blind, Christ speaking to the woman at the well and telling her, you have five husbands. These are things maybe she had hidden. And he's a stranger. A stranger cannot just tell you things that are so personal about your life. Those are the signs. The belief of Jesus, that Nathaniel believed in, believed in Jesus when he, he, tr- he said, you are truly the Messiah. And it is not him alone, even Nicodemus. It is as they As we continue reading this lesson, we'll find out that Nicodemus even became a follower of Christ. And he even came and and like Pilate, who was not able to make a decision, for him he made a decision and even asked them, shall we persecute a man without listening to his side of the story? Then we move to us. Are we any different? You know, when these things are presented to us, you know, when we are... These people are saying that give us a sign, even after being fed, you know, we are like, what are these people? How come they are not believing? We are so quick to judge the Pharisees. We are so quick to point fingers and say these people should have believed. But in should it be flipped, Kidogo, like just a little bit? Would you have made the decision that they made or would you have made a different decision? If you were in the shoes of Pilate, would you have made the better decision or you would have just ended up like him? So it is so easy for us to point fingers and look at the mistakes upon which others have made. But looking at ourselves, are we able to do any better? The last thing is our witness has been the Holy Spirit. He has provided us. He has quickened our understanding to know that he is Christ. To know that, you know, this word was written, the prophecies in Isaiah, they were written for us to understand that Christ would have would come. But how we letting the Holy Spirit lead us or we are just there trying to be theological about everything, even things that are so plain and true to us. I am just asking again, what is your witness? Do you have a witness that indeed I have been with Jesus? I know Jesus exists for sure. Christ exists that even if you are put at the judgment you, even if you are put in court to actually just give evidence or rather witness that Christ is there, are you able to do that? The lesson writer says, each one of us in our own way and of our own relationship with God 
can have a story to tell. Do you have a story to tell based on your relationship with Christ? Beloved, we have come to the end of lesson seven. We have just been talking about the blessedness of those that believe. There is a lot to count in or there is a lot of joy in just believing in Christ. The centurion will tell you about this, that he believed that Christ is able to heal the child and he was able to witness it. So blessed are you if you believe. And at this point, just as a way of closing this uh, lesson study, I'll ask the panel, why do you believe in God? Please feel free to tell us an instance, if you have, that made you so much believe in Jesus Christ. Starting with you, Chris Paul. Amen. Why do I believe in Jesus? Uh, Jesus is my friend. I have come. The songwriter said, I have found a friend, oh, such a friend, uh, who loved me before I knew him. He, to be honest, um, every day I wake up during the weekdays and I'm going to work, I always have the conscious presence that Jesus is by my side. And that has built my relationship with him. It has revolutionized whatever I do because knowing that Jesus is by my side has made me have the peace that the world can never give. And that has changed my life. It has transformed me. It has, I have seen his hand in even how him doing, intervening in situations. I was, I, w I would have spoken a word that would have uh, really hurt someone. And then at that point, gives, God gives me a word in season. So for me, my faith in Christ is founded on this personal relationship of friendship I have had with him. And indeed, I can say I love him. Amen. 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 Um, I totally concur with my brother. And, and just to bear similar witness is, truly Jesus is just simply the gift that keeps on giving. Um, in him, we have found respite. In him, we have found joy. In him, we have found true in satisfaction and to him uh, to us he has been a savior he has been a friend and in many other ways he has been to us and our witness of Jesus uh, on a personal level I think I have seen God come and Christ come through for me in multiple ways and I think uh, generally uh, you can only have a witness for Christ if you accept him and if you allow him, invite him into your situations and into your difficulties. I have seen in Christ, um, for example, maybe my experience will be like the experience of, of, of Mary, one who has been there uh, with me from, uh, from while I was in the dirt, you know, while, uh, while things were difficult, while things were thick, while things were not very pretty. One who sticks with us and, 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 and bears long and hard with us. And I found in him a friend, as, as, as Crispal has inferred to that him, who loves us even before we knew him. That's, that's powerful. And, and beyond loving us, his love is not the love of ignorance because there sometimes, you know, there are people who, who respect me uh, because of what they see about me or what they know about me, the, the good things, uh, the accomplishments here and there. But Christ knows the dirty stuff. Christ knew those, those things. Christ knows the scandals. Christ knows the struggles, personal and private. And in the midst of, with full knowledge of all this, he still raises up his hand and invites, uh, and, and invites me to walk with him. He still similarly raises up his hands and, and, and his voice and his instruments to invite each and every single one of us into a relationship with him. And that, 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 that to me is, a, is, a, is, a, is a most, the most, um, the most, um, the chiefest of all relationships in which you are known and understood completely and nonetheless accepted and called and helped to improve. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, coming to the end of this lesson, I'll just ask you, beloved, why do you believe in Christ? Why? Why do you believe in Christ? I'm repeating so that you may 
have a moment of reflection and ask yourself, do you believe in Christ because your mom does or your dad does? Or it is fashionable to believe in Christ or because there is no other option for me. I just have to believe in Christ. Do you have a witness? Do you have a personal story that you can tell when asked, why do you believe in Christ? It's been wonderful studying with you. And we thank you again for joining us and invite you once again for the next lesson eight. May you be blessed. I'll ask that uh, Myron, please, to close for us with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our Lord, we come before your presence this Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. We thank you uh, for the message this day that you've told us that blessed are they that believe. And Lord, if there be any unbelief within us, we pray that you may help our unbelief and teach us to believe in you, Lord, and grow our faith as well in our Christian experience. May you be with us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. 